Hi, thanks for watching this message. Here at New Life Church, we believe the Word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. We hope you enjoy the sermon. You guys ready to get in the Word? All right, if you uh, brought your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And I'm going to read uh, through verse four. Here's what it says. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. So Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. It's a church he helped start. And he's addressing a really popular trend that was happening throughout the early church. What was happening is Jewish believers that were getting saved and following Jesus uh, were um, requiring new believers that were not Jewish to follow all of the laws and the customs of Jewish culture. And they were basically drawing an equal sign between circumcision and following the Jewish religious system, drawing an equal sign between that and following Jesus. Even though uh, the requirement that Jesus placed on people to be made right with God is repentance from sin and faith in the Son of God, faith that his death on the cross really did pay for your sins, and faith in him as the Lord of your life, you make him the king, that means he calls the shots, we don't call the shots for ourselves anymore. That's the requirement for salvation according to Christ and according to the scriptures. But these people were coming along and they were saying, no, 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 you got to do a little extra. <clears throat> Excuse me. You got to do a little extra. You got, in addition to repentance and faith in Jesus, you got to do these rituals. You have to be circumcised and all these physical things. And what Paul is, and, and the way that they were going about it was really exclusive. They were really trying to, to, to set themselves apart from the believers that were, uh, that were not Jewish, that were following Jesus. They were, they were causing divisions. They were trying to set themselves up as higher and almost like you're a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God if you don't do all these things. And so Paul, uh, that really angered Paul uh, because he didn't like the idea of uh, people being shut out or excluded uh, from experiencing the gospel. Because Paul understood the power of the gospel, he said in Romans 1, he said, uh, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, meaning that the message of Jesus Christ and the invitation to turn from your own way, to repent and to put your faith in him, that message is actually the power of God. It's not human wisdom that leads people to Jesus. It's not arguments. It's not scientific evidence. It's not debates in philosophy. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul said that God set it up so that no one can come to him through human wisdom, through human reason. But instead, he uses our foolish preaching to lead people to Christ. That simply declaring the message that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for the sins of humanity, raised on the third day in victory, ascended, is seated at the right hand of the Father and is one day returning to set up his kingdom. And all who repent and believe in him can be a part of that kingdom and experience eternal life instead of the wages of sin, right? That message has the power. I don't have power, not in and of, in and of myself. My ability to, co to communicate is not where the power is. Your ability to communicate, that's not where the power of the gospel lies. It, the gospel has its own power. <laughs> 
It's the power of God unto salvation. And so uh, Paul understood this, that uh, this message in the power of God saves people and God is extremely powerful. Amen? Right? He's all powerful. Meaning because of what Jesus did and because of the power of God, salvation is easy. I don't mean salvation is easy like it's a get out of jail free card, like you pray this prayer, keep living for yourself and you'll inherit the kingdom. No, if Jesus isn't your king, you can't be a part of his kingdom. But salvation is easy in, in that to enter the kingdom, it requires very little effort and striving on our part. Jesus said, if you want to enter the kingdom, you must come in like one of these little children, right? You don't have to know everything. You don't have to have everything figured out. You can even have questions. But you just have to be willing to trust God, to transfer your trust from all that other stuff you've been trusting in to satisfy you, to cleanse you, to make you a good person, whatever, and fully trust in what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Amen. And, uh, <clears throat> and so because Paul knew that, uh, it angered him that these people were placing all these hefty requirements on people to be saved. Uh, it, it, it was excluding people. It was making people feel like they had to crawl over broken glass in order to have a relationship with God. That's not faith. That's not the kingdom. That's not the gospel. The gospel... Bible says in Romans 10, I think that the faith that pleases God says uh, it's not too far away. It's actually really close at hand. The faith that pleases God looks at lost people and says, man, they're one conversation away from eternal life. I don't care how far gone they are. They're one prayer from God completely changing their life. They're one testimony. They're one word. They're one conversation away. It's easy for him to save. It's not my power. It's his power. If I will just open up my mouth and say the message, the Holy Spirit will add himself to it with supernatural influence. He'll impact their heart and he'll move them towards response. Okay, salvation is easy. It angered Paul that these people were putting all these requirements on people. And I do want to clarify something really quick. The requirements that they were putting on them were specific to the Jewish laws and customs. So it was like, don't eat this, uh, have to be circumcised, you have to follow these certain festivals and things like that in order to truly be a Christian, okay? That was the thing that angered Paul, that was the thing that was, uh, that, that was anti what God was trying to do. Growing up, a lot of times I heard preaching about this topic, where people would say things like, uh, we are not under the spirit of the law, but under the spirit of grace, right? You can't earn your salvation. Um, it's not by, we are saved by grace through faith. It's not of our works so that no man can boast. And a lot of times, they would take this example in the Bible, and they would apply it to the moral requirements of a person that claims to follow Jesus. You get what I'm saying? So like, if, you, if, if somebody uh, wants to give their life to God and they're sleeping around or they're hooking up and you say, hey, I urge you to repent from that lifestyle that leads to death. God loves you. He'll forgive you in an instant. He'll set you free. That doesn't even satisfy. Jesus is so much better. Turn from that, turn to God they would look at that and they would say, oh, you're being legalistic. You're putting requirements on people to be saved. And they compare it to this. Paul told people to turn from sexual immorality all the time. Paul told people to turn from idolatry all the time. Paul never winked at sin. He never uh, ignored sin. He never was tolerant or permissive about sin. And so... Just to clarify, we can't apply this to issues of sin. This is like extra religious activity to try to be righteous. But the Bible's so clear. If we want a right relationship with God, we do have to turn away from our sin. Does that make sense? 
I just wanted to be extra, super duper clear about that. I'm a sucker for clarity. So Paul writes to the Philippians just to give them some confidence to clear things up. He's like, guys, don't get bogged down with all these regulations. Don't get bogged down with the festivals and circumcision and all that stuff. And these people that were going around, they were calling themselves, uh, they were calling themselves the circumcision, meaning like we're the true believers. We're the, we're the authentic believers. We're, we're the ones that are truly right with God because we have Jesus and we have the law of Moses and we have all these rituals and stuff like that. And so Paul says, those guys aren't the real circumcision. They're not the real believers. They're dogs. They're evil do- doers. They're, they're mutilators. The Lord is not into, into for, for making people right with him, he's not about circumcising bodies. He's about circumcising hearts. I'm sorry for making you uncomfortable because I keep saying circumcision. <laughs> it's in the Bible, I'm sorry. The idea was that that was a sign of the old covenant and uh, what the Lord was basically saying is, hey, I, I'll actually cut away the hard layer of your heart so that you can have a tender, responsive heart to me, that we can have a relationship. That if you'll put your faith in me, uh, I'll actually change your appetites and your desires. I'll inspire your heart to want to live for me. I'll inspire you to want to turn away from uh, wickedness and want to serve me and want to lead other people to me if you let me. And so after Jesus, God was into circumcising people's hearts and Paul goes, they're not the real ones. We are the circumcision. We are the true believers. And who is we? We who worship God in the spirit who rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That was Paul's super succinct, like basic, most simple description of what authentic Christianity is. Worship in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And I like that because I'm not just a sucker for clarity, I'm a sucker for simplicity. Why use lot word when few word do trick? (laughs) Right? And so uh, this passage makes me think of uh, a scene in the in the show Band of Brothers. It's an old World War II show, and there it's about the the guys that were airborne rangers. So they would drop in behind enemy lines uh, uh, from an airplane and then have to regroup, and they would fight. So they were most most of these guys were on the front lines of the battle. They were in the action day in day out, risking their lives day in, day out. And there's this scene in Band of Brothers where the new guys get here. The new guys show up. They've never been in battle. All they've been in is basic training. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, all they've been in is basic training and uh, they're, they're kind of fresh. They're green, right? And so they show up and the new guys are, or the old guys that have been in battle are looking at them and the new guys have all this equipment on they had a big old backpack and the canteen and helmet and pencil and spoon and fork and compass and all these different, just like their pockets are all full. They have all these stuff hanging off of them. You know, they're, they're, they're like limping around because of how much equipment they have on. And the old guys start going up to them and just start ripping stuff off of them. And they're kind of aggressive too. It's like, they weren't polite about it. They start ripping stuff off of them. And they're like, not gonna need that, not gonna need that, not gonna need that. That's gonna slow you down. That's gonna get you killed. You will need a couple more of these actually. Here's a few more grenades. Here's a few more magazines or whatever. And they just start stripping away all of the unnecessary accoutrements that aren't needed to be successful in battle. Because these guys have been through it. That's what Paul's doing for the Philippians. He's doing for us. He's been through it. He knows what it's like to live for God, to endure, to be effective, to walk in, you know, power and all this. So he's saying, hey, let me just strip it down. This is authentic Christianity. Worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. Have no confidence in the flesh. So what does it mean to worship God in the spirit? To worship God in the spirit is to rely on the help of the Holy Spirit to connect with God as opposed to religious practice. 
There's nothing physical that we can do to automatically get closer to God. Like just showing up to church, it's not automatic that you'll connect with the Lord. Just reading your Bible, check the, now those are helpful, don't get me wrong, come to church, read your Bible. But the physical act, when, we, when you get water baptized, it's just water. It's not holy water, it's not magic, it doesn't do anything. The water itself doesn't do anything. <clears throat> when you take communion, it's just bread, it's just juice. We got it from H-E-B or Sam's or somewhere. Like, like, the, like the elements themselves are, are not uh, special. And so worshiping God in spirit is, I'm not gonna shut my heart off when I come before the Lord and kind of do this drive-through thing where I, I'm disengaged and I'm actually committed to my own priorities but I'm gonna throw God a bone and I'll go to church. Or I'll read the verse of the day on the Bible app. Or I'll take communion because I haven't in a while and I kind of been wanting to, you know. Or I'll get baptized because that's what everybody else is doing. Even meaning well, it, it doesn't, there's, there's nothing there. God established it so that we come to him, we connect with him in spirit. Meaning our spirit, when we're born again, our spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit and he's our escort into the presence of God. We need the Holy Spirit to connect with God. We need the Holy Spirit to hear God. We need the Holy Spirit to be transformed in God's presence. We need the Holy Spirit to understand the Bible. We need the Holy Spirit to desire things that God, that please God. We need the Spirit to lead us, to escort us and the only value that coming to church or reading your Bible or taking communion or getting water baptized, the only value in the physical things is as much as they position us to be led by the Holy Spirit. Or I'll put it this way. These things are tools in the hand of the Holy Spirit. We're giving him something to work with. But ultimately it's him. It's not the thing. It's not, it's not us. How do you know if you're worshiping in the spirit? 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Is there freedom in your life or is there bondage? Are there things that you feel have control over you? John 16.13 says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. Are you committed to the truth? Or are you committed to having a certain image? Are you committed to living honestly before God, before people, or hearing the truth even if it hurts? Or are you committed to a narrative that's comfortable, that makes you feel like you can make sense of things and feel good about yourself? John 15, 26 says, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. When the Holy Spirit's involved, Jesus is number one. Are you worshiping in spirit? Is Jesus your top priority? Is his glory your aim? Are you looking past even the issue? And God cares about our issues. He cares about our struggles, cares about our hurts. Healed Sloan, from, a, from what she called a minor thing. She's like, it's so small. Why would God heal me? Because he cares. He cares. But can you see past the issue? Can you see past what's the matter right now to a greater purpose, to the glory of Jesus, to him having more of you, more of your life, more of your family? Or is he just a means to get what you need? Who's God? You serve him or does he serve you? When we worship in spirit, Jesus is number one. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, he's the beginning, the middle, and the end. The Bible says that everything is from him and for him and to him. He's the cause. He's the point of everything. And he's the end result. So anything that gets our eyes off of Jesus as number one, that's not of the Holy Spirit. Even if it's religious, even if it has spiritual language attached to it. Because the thing about these guys that were trying to put all these requirements on people, 
uh, they were doing that because they were insecure about their standing with God. Their faith, they weren't believing that the cross was enough, so they needed something else, a security blanket. And then they projected that on other people, said, you gotta do this too. Sometimes the people that act the most religious, use the most religious language, or, or fancy themselves the most spiritual one in the room, a lot of times they're the most insecure. Because Jesus was God, and we read this earlier, he put his deity aside. He took the place of a slave. He was humble. He didn't lord. Think of how much he knew. He created the universe. He knew so much. Never once did he lord that over people. He served. He was humble. There were times where he was quiet, and people thought, you should be speaking up, Jesus. He was, he was lowly. He was meek. He considered others' needs above his own. He didn't parade himself about. And anytime he was given an amount of honor or, or praise, it was never something he sought after. It was always a byproduct of him obeying the Father. That was unrelated. That was totally for free. The evidence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life, it's in Galatians, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Is this fruit in your life? Are you worshiping in spirit? The evidence of the Holy Spirit in a church are people being saved, are people being healed, are people being set free, are people being filled with the fire of God. If it's not happening, the Holy Spirit's not present and you can have church and the Holy Spirit not be there. Jesus warned the churches in Revelation. He said, if you don't, I got some issues that I need y'all to settle. If you don't get it right, I'm gonna take your lampstand away. I'm gonna remove your influence. In other words, you can have church. I'm just not gonna be there. And so yes, it's possible to do the stuff and the Holy Spirit not be involved at all because he's committed solely to Jesus' purposes. He's not a tool that we can use to garner influence with people. He's Lord, we're submitted to him, we follow him, and he leads us to Jesus, and when we have Jesus, we have everything we need. And that's not just like a feel-good statement, it's so true. Lastly, we rejoice in Jesus, or in Christ Jesus, and we have no confidence in the flesh. This one is kind of tough for people. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he said, I've had one message for Jew and Gentile alike. The necessity of repentance from sin and faith in the Lord Jesus. What, do you, what did he mean by that? He's had one message for people. The necessity of repentance, turning from sin, the necessity of faith. There's some of us here that we got the repentance thing down. We turned away from dead works. We've turned away from things that we know are destructive. But we are struggling to believe that he really made us clean. We're struggling to believe that we really are sons and daughters of God. We're struggling to believe that we really do have access to everything the Bible says we have access to. And we're waiting around passively for a light bulb to go off and us to feel better. When's it gonna happen? Maybe I can learn more. If I do more, I'll finally have that click, that light bulb, and I'll finally feel saved, or I'll finally feel like a son, or I'll finally feel accepted by God. And Paul's saying, necessity of faith. You can't wait around passively for it. You've gotta exercise your faith and reach out and believe and embrace what Jesus did on the cross and embrace it exclusively, not Jesus plus. But it's that's our part. He, he, we can't do his part. He won't do our part. We have to exercise faith. The righteous shall live by faith, the Bible says. It's impossible to please God without faith. And here's the thing. When you, when you reach out with your faith and you go, God, I, I'm so messed up, but I'm gonna turn my eyes away from myself and I'm just gonna look at your Bible, what the Bible says about you, what the Bible says about me, and I'm just gonna look at it, I'm just gonna say yes to it. Just like, Lord, I believe it, I accept it, I embrace it. When you believe and you put your faith in just what Christ has done for you, nothing else, there is a peace and a joy, there's a revelation that takes place. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is a spirit of adoption. He testifies to our spirit 
that we really are sons of God. The Bible calls him the spirit of Jesus. The Holy Spirit, when we exercise our faith, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to relate to God the way that Jesus related to God. Well, Jesus was perfect. We can relate to God as if we were perfect. And that's scandalous, because we're not. But he was. And then he shed his blood. And then he washed us with it. So we are. Not based on us, but by faith we believe this. And so you got people that don't feel like they can come close to God. You don't feel, people feel like God can use them because they don't really believe that they're clean, that they've been cleansed. Well, you can't wait around for the light bulb. You have to decide that you believe, like Sloan's testimony. And when you really believe that God did for you what the Bible says he did for you, you will believe it for other people. You won't, you won't look at people as far away like, no matter how bad they are, how rough around the edges, you will not see people as like, man, I don't, how, it's gonna take a miracle. How, I don't see how the Lord's ever gonna get a hold of them. You'll see everybody as close. Like I said, oh, they're just one conversation away. And you'll look at everybody through the lens of God's ability to save rather than through the lens of your own weakness. This phrase that I got before one night, preach like the harvest is ripe. Preach like there's people, preach like God can save. Preach like people are gonna respond to the Lord. Pray like it's gonna happen. Speak like he can get a hold of them. Preach like the harvest is ripe. Not like you have to convince a bunch of unbelieving people, but knowing that the gospel is the power of God, all I gotta do is open up my mouth. His is the power to save. You'll take more risks. You'll be more compassionate and patient with people. You'll give people a chance. You'll invite people to church. You'll share your faith. You'll share your testimony. And you're not, you're not gonna do it based on your expertise or experience. You're gonna do it because you believe in God's ability to save. And then no confidence in the flesh. I'm gonna invite us to stand for a response. Here's the last thing. I'll even invite the prayer teams to just come up now, come forward. We put no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in our ability to perform and earn God's approval, but trust that by the blood of Jesus, we've been given God's approval so we can live out that reality. We can live like a son, live like a daughter because we've already been adopted. There's a trend right now, it's, uh, it's mostly among young people and it's, it's not a trend to conform to Judaism. <laughs> But there is an overwhelming pressure on young people, especially new believers, to be able, or I'll put it this way, there's, a, there's overwhelming pressure to rely on your own ability to hear the voice of God directly. And people will make you feel like if God's not telling you what to eat for breakfast, you're not, you don't really, you're not close with him, you don't have a relationship. Even though he's revealed himself in his word, even though he's put spiritual leaders in your life, wise counsel to help you, for whatever reason, people are making you feel like you've gotta have it all figured out and you've gotta be hearing from God on the daily, on the regular, and every decision you make has to be something the Lord told you to do. I just wanna break that pressure, that is not real. God doesn't even mostly, he's not Google Maps. When we pray and we go to him, it's not mostly for direction or answers like a magic eight ball. It's mostly so that we can connect with him on the heart level and his character is revealed to us so that we move forward in the future, not because we know what's gonna happen, but because we know who he is and what he's like and we trust in his character. The Bible says that Israel knew God's Way, or, uh, works. Israel knew God's works, but Moses knew his ways. Israel only knew about the miracles, but God, uh, Moses saw God face to face. He knew his character. He knew what he was like. So Israel, they were living miracle to miracle. Every time something happened, they would get into unbelief. They would get into fear. They would get into complaining. They didn't have a relationship with God. They were just getting answers. So when things went wrong, 
they buckled. But when things went wrong for Moses, he said, listen, I don't know how we're gonna get out of this, but I know he's Jehovah Jireh. I know he's a provider. I know he's gonna make a way. There's people getting bit by snakes. And this is a reference to the Old Testament. Man, I don't know how this is gonna work, but I know he's Jehovah Rapha. I know he's gonna heal him. He'll make a way. I don't know how, but he's going to. Let me just listen or just trust and believe and obey. So that, do not feel this pressure. Here's what I would say. That's, that is confidence in the flesh. It sounds spiritual, but it's confidence in the flesh because it's confidence in your ability to perfectly discern the will of God. None of us can perfectly do that. We need the Bible. We need other people around us to give us wise counsel and truth. We need to be humble. Even if we do feel like we're hearing from the Lord, let's be careful with that phrase and move forward in humility because when we walk in humility and not confidence in the flesh, it gives the Holy Spirit something to work with in our lives and we worship the Spirit. We worship in the Spirit. So we're about to respond. Let me just pray for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to be an authentic expression of your kingdom in Corpus Christi. Would you make us those who worship you in the Holy Spirit, that we don't rely on routine, we don't rely on our own discipline, we don't rely on certain phrases or certain posture or certain whatever, but we rely on the leadership of the Holy Spirit, God. We come humbly before you and we say, Lord, I know yesterday you did it a different way, but today I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know you're going to lead me where I need to go and you're going to reveal Jesus to me. Let us be those who have confidence in what Jesus did on the cross, not focused on our lack or our weakness, but we're focused by what he accomplished in his sinless life, his death on the cross, his resurrection. Let us be people that walk in confidence in what God can do through us in this city, not because of our works or our ability, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the blood and the power of the gospel. Let us be people that take risks because we know you can, we know you will, we know you're able. Let us walk in confidence. Let us look different from the world. Let us be set apart. And Lord, if there's any area of our life where we are putting confidence in our ability, our discernment, our wisdom, the way that seems right to us, reveal it to us so we can repent and we can turn and put all of our trust on that cross, all of our chips on bread, all of our faith in the blood, Lord. Help us, God. Church, let's just respond. I'll invite you to come forward. However you need to, this is your time. Thanks for watching online. Don't forget to follow us on social media at New Life Corpus. And we love to see you on Sunday at either 9, 11, or 1 o'clock services.